Hi, I'm Nicole McGavick, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The National Weather Service is made up of 122 weather forecast offices across the country. We make seven day forecasts and we also issue severe weather watches and warnings. A meteorologist has to observe, analyze, forecast, and communicate forecast information. A meteorologist is a scientist who studies the weather. And one way to study it is to observe what's happening. And to do that, we need lots of instruments to help us measure the weather. An important instrument for a meteorologist is a thermometer. You probably have one of these at home. Do you remember what a thermometer measures? It measures temperature or how hot or cold it is. This next instrument is called an anemometer. Can you guess what it's measuring? It's measuring the wind speed. The faster the wind blows, the faster the anemometer will spin. Here's a big one here, and there's a little one on here. Now this little one has something on the top called the vane, and the vane will move about depending on which direction the wind is blowing from. And so it's important for meteorologists to know not only how fast the wind is blowing, but where the wind is coming from. This instrument here is called a rain gauge. Inside of this, the top here is a funnel. I don't know if you can see, there's a little hole in the middle of it. So the rain falls in the big opening and then funnels down through into a smaller tube, which has a ruler on it. So what happens is we have people who are volunteers and every morning they'll go outside and see how much rain fell in the rain gauge over the last 24 hours. So when it rains, the rain will fall in the bigger opening here and go through the funnel into that smaller cylinder. And our volunteers will then come out and pull out this smaller cylinder and they'll look to see how much rain fell by using the ruler that's on the inner cylinder. And then they call that into us every day so we know how much rain fell. Now some rain gauges don't need a person to read them. They're automated and they are called tipping bucket rain gauges. Inside the funnel at the bottom is a little teeter-totter and each side can hold one one hundredth of an inch of rain. So the rain will fill up one side of the teeter-totter and then it'll tip over and the other side will start to fill up immediately. And when that reaches one one hundredth of an inch, it tips over and it keeps going back and forth. And there's a counter inside that counts up each time the teeter-totter tips back and forth. And that's how we know how much rain has fallen. Next is an instrument called a salometer. Salometer sounds a lot like ceiling, right? Well, to a meteorologist, a ceiling is a layer of clouds. And so a salometer sends a laser beam up into the sky and if it hits a cloud, that laser beam gets reflected back down to the sensor and we can tell how many clouds or how cloudy or sunny the sky is. The salometer also tells us how high the clouds are. A barometer measures air pressure. We need to know what the pressure is because high pressure tends to give us sunny, cloudless skies and low pressure often means that it's going to be stormy. Finally, we have a visibility sensor. This instrument has two uh, parts to it. On one side is a part that sends out a laser beam and the other side is looking for that laser beam. And if there's something in the air like fog or smoke, then the second uh, sensor cannot see that laser beam very well. And so it can tell us if it's very foggy um, or very smoky out. The National Weather Service takes all of these different instruments and puts them together to make the automated surface observing system, which is found usually at airports. Now that we have all of our measurements from our instruments, we need to analyze that information. To do that, we plot all of our measurements on a map. So each of these dots represents a location that has all of those meteorological instruments. Um, we use numbers to represent temperature, dew point, and pressure. And then we can use symbols to help us uh, identify whether there's fog or rain. The long lines with the barbs on the end represent the wind speed and direction. And so after we plot these, then we can look for differences between one area of the country and another. If it's cold in one area and warm in another, where the difference is, where that boundary is, we know there's a cold front. We often see a different change in direction of the wind along a cold front as well. 
a, and this is represented by the blue line with the blue triangles. If there's a difference between a dry air mass, an area where it's really dry, and an area where um, there's a lot of moisture in the air, that would be a dry line. And we use these boundaries to help us identify what types of weather may be coming because we tend to see stormy weather along cold fronts and even sometimes along dry lines. Have you ever had a birthday balloon filled with helium? Maybe one that looks kind of like this? And did you accidentally let it go outside? What happened to it? It floated off into the sky, right? Well, a weather balloon is just like that except instead of a weight at the bottom, it has a package of weather instruments that it carries up into the sky. And it's not this size, it's much, much bigger. The National Weather Service launches weather balloons two times every day in 92 different places across the United States. And actually there are weather balloons that are launched across the entire world. Each weather balloon carries an instrument package which transmits all that weather data back to us like temperature and wind speed and direction. The weather balloon can get as high as 25 miles up into the sky to the top of the atmosphere before it pops. That's higher than an airplane flies. The balloon starts off at about six feet wide uh, when it's first inflated and then by the time it gets to the top of the atmosphere, it is nearly 20 feet wide. So just like we did with the instruments that are on the ground, we need to analyze the information and we do that for weather balloons by plotting them on what's called a skew t log p diagram instead of on a map. And we use this then to analyze the atmosphere from near the ground all the way up to the very top. We also have special satellites that are up in space that orbit around the earth and they take measurements of the earth. These instruments can tell us things like where there's dry air or really moist air, uh, where there's clouds or no clouds, and even where there's lightning. If you were an astronaut out in space looking down at Earth, that's what a hurricane would look like there on the left. And that's what we can see from a satellite. Back here on Earth, another important instrument is a radar. A radar looks like a giant ball sitting up on top of a tower, but inside that ball is a radar dish. And that radar dish spins around in circles and also goes up and down. And the whole time it's sending out fast pulses of energy. When those pulses of energy hit raindrops, they get reflected back to the radar and the radar can see that. And depending on how many drops there are, how big they are, if there's hail, we can plot that in different colors to represent how heavy the rain is or how big the hail is. And we see that as reflectivity. You often see this when watching the weather on TV. The radar can also tell us how fast the raindrops are moving and if they're moving toward or away from the radar. And we can use that to help us to see if the storm is rotating or spinning around or even if there's a possible tornado. People have been watching and studying clouds for a long time. And if you know different cloud types, you might be able to know what kind of weather is coming next. There are four basic cloud categories. Zeroform clouds are the clouds that are way up high and typically made of ice. You have cumuliform clouds, those are the puffy clouds. Nimbus form clouds are ones that make rain and stratiform clouds are ones that are in a layer or a blanket. We have clouds that are low, middle clouds, which often are start with alto, and high clouds, which are typically the cirrus clouds. We can combine different forms like the cumulonimbus cloud. Those are big thunderstorms. You can often tell if a cloud is made of ice or water by how it looks. If it looks kind of fuzzy and not really crisp, then it's made of ice crystals. If the edges are really crisp and it looks kind of like cauliflower, then that part of the cloud is made of water. Just like a cake recipe, you have to have all the ingredients there in order to get a cake that you can eat. Similarly, thunderstorms have ingredients that they need in order to develop. So a recipe for thunderstorms, you need moisture, lift, instability, and wind shear. Moisture is in the form of water vapor, and that water vapor will condense into cloud droplets, and those cloud droplets will combine to form raindrops. You also need lift. 
lift helps to get that moisture and the warm moist air near the ground up into the upper part of the atmosphere into the air for clouds to form and then develop into thunderstorms. Oftentimes we get lift from boundaries like cold fronts and warm fronts and dry lines. Low pressure can also help with lift. So another ingredient needed for thunderstorms is something called instability. The opposite of instability is stable. And I want to show you what stable means. Stable is when you give something some energy and it moves about but goes back to where it started. So I have a bowl here and a tennis ball and it's starting right here in the middle. I'm going to give it some energy and let's see what happens. Give it some energy, it's moving around, but when it finally comes to a stop, it's right back where it started. So this is a stable system. If it's unstable, if there is instability present, then when we give energy to an object, the ball here for example, it's going to keep going and not go back to where it started. So here we go, let's give us some energy and see what happens now. The ball kept going and going and it didn't come back to where it started. So the same thing happens in the atmosphere. When the atmosphere is stable, you have like a bubble of air near the ground and it starts to go up and it wants to go up and make a cloud. But if it's stable, it just comes right back down to where it started near the ground and the cloud never forms. If the atmosphere is unstable, then that bubble of air near the ground starts to go up and it keeps going up and up and up and eventually gets high enough that it's able to develop into a cloud. And if there's enough instability, you can get a really big cloud and a big thunderstorm to develop. The energy that's used to make that bubble go up is usually heat. So the sun is heating up the air near the ground and that gives it energy. And that's what gets it to start moving up the sky. Another ingredient for thunderstorms is something called wind shear. And wind shear is when the wind near the ground is moving slower than the wind higher up in the sky, in the atmosphere. So my arm here is gonna represent the slow moving wind near the ground and my other hand is gonna represent the fast moving air higher up. And so this air here is in between. And watch what happens when the faster air is happening on top of the slower air. Here we go. Can you see what's happening to this tube here? It's starting to spin, right? That's called rotation. And then if we have rotation occurring and lift, like we talked about earlier, that lift will cause the rotation to turn vertical up and down. And so now you have the storm that is spinning. And if the storm is rotating or spinning like this, it can keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and sometimes becomes a severe thunderstorm. And even at times, this uh, rotation can get lower and lower in that thunderstorm and sometimes even make a tornado. Thunderstorms can produce a lot of hazardous weather, including lightning, heavy rain and flooding, hail, strong winds, and even tornadoes. All thunderstorms make lightning. If you can hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning and need to find a safe place. You see the lightning first and then you hear the thunder. Why is that? Well, the speed of light is faster than the speed of sound. So you can use this to help determine how far away a storm is. When you see the flash of lightning, count the number of seconds until you hear the thunder roll. Then divide by five, and that'll tell you how many miles away the lightning is. So, do you have to be close to where it's raining to be struck by lightning? Nope, lightning can travel 10 miles or even more away from where it's raining. So what do you do if you do hear thunder or see lightning? you need to take shelter right away. But where is a safe place to go? Pause the video and look at these different places. Can you tell which place is safe and which place is not? Safe places include buildings that are enclosed on all four sides and have a hard roof, such as houses and stores, definitely not picnic shelters or dugouts. Cars also offer protection as long as they also have a hard roof. Fabric roofs or convertibles offer no protection. You also want to stay away from water since it can conduct electricity. While all thunderstorms produce dangerous lightning, 
Some thunderstorms can become severe if the right ingredients are in place. A severe thunderstorm can produce large hail, at least one inch in, in diameter, which is the size of a quarter or larger, 58 mile per hour winds or stronger, or even tornadoes. A tornado is a violently rotating column of air in contact with both the cloud and the ground. Tornadoes come in many different shapes and sizes, and some are easy to identify as tornadoes, but others are more difficult. The National Weather Service sends out meteorologists to look at damage that's made by tornadoes, and we use that damage to determine how strong the tornado is. We give it a rating between an EF0 and an EF5. One of the most important jobs for a meteorologist is to help you know when there may be tornadoes or other severe weather. At the National Weather Service, meteorologists are always watching for those ingredients for tornadoes. And if we see those ingredients are gonna be around, then we issue a tornado watch. And that just means be ready, all the ingredients are there and tornadoes are possible. Then we use things like radar and we watch storms carefully to see if a tornado is going to happen right now. And if that's the case, we issue a tornado warning. If you hear a tornado warning, that means to act right now and get to your safe place. Have you practiced your tornado drill at school? How about at home? If you haven't, maybe today would be a great day to try that out. If there's a tornado warning for your area, do not go outside and look for it. We want you to get in, get down, and cover up. You need to get into a sturdy building and get down into the most interior room on the lowest floor. Or if you have a safe room, get into your safe room. You want to then cover your head. If you're in a vehicle, a mobile home, or a trailer, you want to get to the nearest sturdy building instead. Remember, get in, get down, and cover up. Wintertime can also bring other dangerous types of weather like snow, ice, blizzards, and very cold temperatures. Meteorologists at the National Weather Service also issue watches and warnings for winter storms too. So we want you to be prepared. One way to do that is to reduce your exposure to the cold. Wear appropriate clothing outside and dress like an onion. That means dress in layers. Have layers that you can put on extra when you're out in the cold, and then you can take them off when you're inside where it's warmer. Your head is like a chimney, just like this football player. Do you see the steam coming off of his head? So make sure you're wearing a hat so you do not lose so much heat. You also wanna prepare, be prepared for extended power outages and have a disaster readiness kit in your car in case you get stuck in the snow. Thanks for watching and I hope you learned something new. If you want to know what the weather is going to be like where you live for the next seven days, check out the National Weather Service's webpage at www.weather.gov or contact your local weather service office.